welcome everybody. I'm I'm Renata Moise, and um, I'm here today with Connie Hussteiner, and we are going to have a conversation about women's sexuality, the sexual revolution, and lots of other things. Um, so our our translator today on the alternative Spanish channel is Elisa Moreno. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, and if everybody who is not um, right now, myself or Connie, um, can mute their, their computer, that would be good so that you don't pop up into the middle from your home <laughs> until we're ready to talk. Um, so Connie, do you wanna start? Start. Well, yeah. I assume most people here in the audience are familiar with Wilhelm Reich and his importance in the many, many fields, most particularly in psychoanalysis, but he had written some pretty important books about sexuality and had really made sexuality a cornerstone in many ways of his research. And uh, so uh, the sexual revolution obviously is a um, catchword that became very well known in the 1960s, but the book that he wrote by that title was actually started in the, around 1930, uh, back at the time, there were many, many psychoanalysts in Europe who had set up uh, free clinics even and were very interested in focusing on the mental health of the common population in Vienna and in other major cities of Europe. Um, and Freud encouraged this development uh, for quite a while and, and Reich was pretty central to some of that growth. So he was, they were the issue of sexuality and how sexuality affects mental health is central to his work. What I have asked myself often is where we are now in terms of our cha the changes in our understanding of sexual behaviors, where we've grown, where we need to go, and uh, what we've learned about women and their sexuality. In particular, I, I'm sorry I, feel, I'm sorry? I just want to suggest if you spoke, I think, a little bit slower. Let's check with Elisa. Sorry. We help a lot. Just we'll a little do. Okay, okay. So there is, uh, I, I have to be honest, I feel that we have too little time to address a very, very large topic. But I think both Renata and I felt it was important that women's sexuality in particular get more of a forum in the field of ergonomy. And uh, I work as a psychiatrist and Renata is a midwife, and we deal on a regular basis with sexuality in general, but it's clear that there have been so many societal changes, cultural changes that I think are happening very quickly and are going, I believe, in a positive direction, but we still have a long ways to go uh, in terms of helping women and their families experience happier sexual lives and understanding what Reich was trying to accomplish in his work in this arena. Uh, so we wanted to go over some topics, uh, issues of contraception, sex education, uh, the effects of hormones on the communities right now, changes in uh, our understandings of sexuality as a consequence. Um, so we had hoped it to be somewhat of an, a more free flowing discussion between Renata and myself. And we're also hoping that people could participate certainly at the end, because we'd be very interested in having more people talk on this subject. You know, when, when Reich was writing and, and certainly in, in, in women had just really received the right to vote maybe in a few years prior to what he was uh, talking about. Um, there was very little contraception available. Abortions uh, often led to death. Uh, he personally experienced that. Women had often very limited rights to any property ownership. I think today it's often hard to imagine how different women's roles were at that time. I think he believed if 
we embraced an attitude that accepted sexuality and loving sexuality as a natural part of the human experience, we would grow into a healthier society. And by allowing uh, women to be more self-determining and understanding and tolerating the, the importance of allowing and encouraging a loving sexual relationships in life, we would have a less neurotic culture. Because, however, of the what um, a great degree of, of uh, neurotic development, uh, we our society has in many ways gone down the road that he anticipated of expressing many secondary sexual impulses, which are often in the form of sexual aggression, excessive pornography, and emotional distancing from the sexual act. So, so I ju we just wanted to open the forum to this topic because we also felt that with the Me Too movement and much more open discussion in recent years about women and violence against women, sexual violence and physical violence, that it's overdue that we look at this topic to also more hopefully understand better what Reich was trying to teach. So, Yes, I, I totally agree, Connie. I think I, it was when I was preparing for this talk, I was looking on my bookshelves and almost every book um, written about Wilhelm Reich is written by men. And there, it's just so interesting how, how where we are now, um, what was going on with society when my grandfather um, was beginning his, his, his life's work um, and the changes in the hundred years to where we are, but also how many things have not changed. Um, when I, when I pr proposed to speak about you know, women's sexuality, I realized I'm coming from a white woman in North America in, on the East Coast of North America. So my, in a rural town. So those experiences are, are perhaps similar to women all over the world, but I'm sure also incredibly different depending on other countries where people are living and the cultural impacts. Um, as, as a midwife, I, I have kind of meet women in, in very vulnerable, um, I, I work in, in an office, not in the homes, but times when they're very open and we can have really honest discussions about things. Um, I, I feel the contraception, I think is something I'd like to talk about um, because it has allowed us to not have 14 children. Um, when my mother moved to Maine in the fifties as a doctor, there were families that did have 16 or 20 children in those days, um, there, were, there, were, there was no contraception available to them. But of course there are places, many places on the, in the world right now where contraception is not available to women. Um, so contraception when it is available in multiple different forms and choices and um, affordable, accessible to all ages, it, it frees us from the over childbearing that otherwise can occur but it also can have effects, you know, in that um, without ovulation, then there's, there isn't that testosterone kind of surge happening. And, and for some women, their, their libido can be decreased, especially by certain hormonal methods, depending on the woman. Um, there, there's also now women, the, the dilemma, and I'm speaking, of course, from a North American perspective of waiting to waiting too long you know having having contraception the career and then being in the later 30s and and desiring children and having that not be easy to to happen so um that to me is interesting and i i don't know um there the sexual response being affected by antidepressants is another thing that i've noticed connie is that something that you 
it it's happens all your... in practice of psychiatry. It's yeah, it's pretty commonplace. Uh, so much so that there are thankfully one or two medications that don't cause uh, sexual side effects. Um, but it's interesting that even in the field of psychiatry, people do not necessarily talk to patients about sexual function very often. There's also commonly used antidepressant that will cause uh, 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 as an erection that doesn't uh, uh, go away, which can mm -hmm. also become a, a, a medically critical issue. Um, but in fact, the issue of antidepressants and their impact on people's sex lives is I think a pretty important one, mostly yeah. because it has become so commonplace that so many people are being treated for uh, depression or anxiety with these medications. A significant part of the population for many, many years of their lives, in fact. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, Jim's asking which anti, uh, anti uh, depressants do not have libido side effects. A uh, Wellbutrin does not have a libido side effect primarily. And that's uh, one that is used often. Usually the first one I think of if I'm treating a young person uh, in particular. Um, one the, thing, Con Connie, that I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was so interested I, when I was thinking about this, I was looking up some statistics and articles and different countries, of course, have different rates of antidepressant use. And mm -hmm. America is the highest. Um, in America, this is from a few couple of years ago, out of a thousand people, 110 people are on an antidepressant. Wow. In Chile was one of the countries with the lowest rates. In Chile, 13 people out of 110 people were on antidepressant. Um, Germany, it was 50 out of um, a thousand people. Men out of a thousand. Yes, out of a thousand. I'm sorry, I, 13 people out of a thousand in Chile, yes. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and it's twice as many women than men in the United States on the antidepressants. Um, overall, 15% of all women, um, which I, anyway, it's, it's quite, quite shocking and, and um, horrible, I think, that, that we are affecting people's sexuality um, with, in that way. But anyway, so other things, Connie, that we were thinking about um, were the differences in male and female sexual response that, that yeah. seems so um, interesting if you think about it. Well, I think when we, when Reich was writing, first of all, obviously, you know, he is a man. And so when he wrote the sexual revolution, even though I feel it was an incredibly important book, I could find a phrase here or there that reflected that fact. In particular, how the consequences of sexual engagement for men and women yes. clearly seems to differ. I mean, from a practical standpoint, even with contraception or abortion options, a woman can be pregnant. And once that occurs, her life is fundamentally altered for the rest of her life. So it's an event, I think uh, often I've read that, it's an event that's important. And I think there have been some studies at Planned Parenthood that would show that often adolescent girls came away from their early or initial sexual encounters with a lot of emotional disappointment. Mm -hmm. Adolescent boys did not feel that way. Now, I know I was trying to read about oxytocin because it is uh, supposed to be the hormone that makes us feel bonded. And uh, I had assumed that the oxytocin uh, might be the more in women than in men. Maybe this accounts for the difference. Uh, it's still unclear to me, but it appears that men as well as women do produce oxytocin in, the, in, in times of orgasm or actually also in phases where they're being affectionately touched, hugging, kissing, caressing, uh, relaxed intimacy will produce oxytocin in both sexes. 
And that is theoretically thought to be the hormone that attaches people to each other. But I think the question remains for me sometimes, it, are, are these behaviors uh, socially influenced? Uh, how much so? Uh, how much are these behaviors our natural biology or not? Uh, there was recent articles in psychiatric journals uh, talking about the fact that traditional masculine roles of being unemotional, strong, distancing yourself from your feelings could actually um, increase the suicide risk for men threefold that men with those more traditional concepts of masculinity are more vulnerable to depression than men who can see their identity in a more fluid manner, which I think is very important to know. Uh, interestingly, the articles about this were written by uh, psychiatric residents, right, who are in their 20s <laughs> in training, who clearly have grown up with a very different understanding of sexuality than I do. And one of the things that Renata and I were discussing is that even for ourselves, you know, things have changed 20 and 40 years for us that, you know, what people in their 20s are experiencing in terms of uh, media, the representation of popular culture, um, it's so different. Right, yeah. And, and it influences how people behave and uh, their emotional choices. Yeah, I think I, I totally, one of the things I was looking at when, when we were thinking about doing this talk was the function of the orgasm. And um, on, at the, in the introduction on page 22, where Reich talks about orgastic potency and that word or phrase in my opinion, has been misinterpreted by the popular press and, and interpreted to mean like fabulous giant orgasm. Right. And that is not what Reich meant. What Reich meant was, and I'll read that section, um, psychic health depends upon orgastic potency. That is on the capacity for surrender in the acme of sexual excitation in the natural sexual act. So this next sentence is the one that's, that's most important, I think. Its basis is the unneurotic character attitude of capacity for love. So that, that being able to be open and, and vulnerable and sensitive. Um, I, I also want to say that nobody has a perfect character. So, uh, you know, I, I, that striving for perfection also can, can get in the way. Um, but I, I do find, or my sense is among the teen girls that I work with is on the most part, and you can never say that you can never make total um, blanket statements, but many of them are, are very open emotionally to their first or early partners. And unfortunately, I, I don't know that that is the case for their partners as much. Um, and personally, I, I blame our society in the treatment of of boys, um, circumcision, um, don't cry, those kind of things. I know that we have come a long, long way since Wilhelm Reich um, faced, you know, the the real Victorian Catholicism, all that. But there is still among a great percentage of the population uh, attitude, little boys are treated differently and boys as they grow up into their sexuality are, are, are treated, are, are exposed differently and, and girls are objectified and, and the girls are seeing that objectification in the whole culture. Um, I'll be quiet and Connie, you say what you think. No, I think it's, it's very true. I, 
you had um, mentioned also the fact that, you know, you come from your cultural background, I come from mine. Uh, I work in Los Angeles, so I probably have much more work with minority groups than you do in Hancock. Yeah. And I, I know it is important to uh, see, even in those communities where there's a fair amount of evolution, I'd say, or progress being made in, um, there are still many uh, pockets of cultures uh, where there's a tremendous amount of sexual unhappiness, massive. And one, uh, recently I've been exposing myself maybe more, spending more time looking at uh, movies or videos and real, feeling as if uh, black women in particular in their music and in their, have been much more inclined to speak openly about relationships then I've seen them doing, well, yeah, much more openly than they have in the past. Um, I remember many years ago, it seemed that uh, Hispanic women and black women were not as involved in the changes in the feminist movement in the seventies as white women were. But it seems that things in some ways are changing that more Hispanic and black women are also concerned about the quality of their lives and trying to take more accounting of that and claim some personal power as opposed to being so disempowered. Um, I think it's uh, you know, the dance of dependence. Uh, when I think about being a woman and being poor and having a child and being responsible for that child and possibly having your support ripped from you because the father has disappeared or doesn't support you anymore. This is an extraordinarily stressful situation that still countless women find themselves in. I know we have laws in the United States and other countries as well to try to compensate for these types of situations. But I find, uh, I, I think of my own patients right now and I know of several women who are facing situations where they, either have been abandoned uh, financially completely uh, with children to be responsible for, or they're suffering abuse and can't leave because they have a child they need to care for and can't figure out the logistics uh, to save themselves. So these problems are still really apparent in the United States. And uh, yeah, I feel, I know Reich talked about this certainly, but the it's really important, I think, for women uh, to fully kind of unfold in terms of our, our capacity for deeper love. Our laws do need to keep up with that. And there has to be some way for women to feel secure that if they do engage emotionally and do have a child, that they're not going to be left high and dry. I think some countries have done a better job of protecting uh, single parents. Yeah. I think Iceland, I think is one of them, if I'm not mistaken, Finland, pretty sure Norway and, and the Netherlands also. You know, in fact, we had talked about the fact that in the Netherlands, you're talking about cultures that in the Netherlands, it was commonplace for parents to allow their adolescent children to stay the night at each other's houses. And that's already been the case for the last 10 years. And that's actually not led to more teen suicide, to teen um, pregnancies, but rather the opposite. And that in the culture there, they make a conscious decision. They did some research on this to talk about sexuality being necessarily connected to love. Yes. And that sex education isn't just about teaching uh, the, the mechanics of it or, or how pregnancy comes. Uh, but rather teaching what is emotionally needed for a successful mm -hmm. sexual embrace. Right. I think that's missing. I mean, we certainly don't have enough sex education in the United States, but the sex education that does exist, um, in my experience, has not included as much that love or emotional piece. It's, it's been very factual. Um, body parts, this is a condom, that sort of thing. Um, and 
I, I, I think I, I'm old now, right? So I'm, I am not really in on the, the modern young teen culture. Um, but there, there has been sort of a, a movement to hooking up and to, to a much casualness, um, which I'm, I'm trying to remain sort of open and, and not judgmental. And at the same time, it, it worries me because that seems like it's missing. You're, you're just taking the sexual revolution and the freedom to, to decide and, and be with different partners, but leaving, leaving off this core importance of the emotional connection. Oh, I agree. I mean, I, I have not, I actually, I have a feeling sometimes that young people are becoming more aware of the need for emotional connectedness. Uh, I think the hookup culture is going to also kind of pass by. Right. And, and I think it will change. I, I hope so. And I, I wonder, I've, I've noticed some of the, the chat met comments come, popping up and I think there may be a socioeconomic difference between um, who is having sex and who isn't when they're younger. I, I see more of it in, in socioeconomic um, families where there is not a plan to go to college. There is not, you know, a career, whatever. Um, it, this, all of it is, is so interesting. Well, you're right. There are no poorer families with no parental oversight where kids are at home in the afternoons by themselves. Uh, statistically, they definitely have more sexual activity. The, the question is, what's the quality of the activity? Right, right. That's and I, and yeah, and the amount of the numbers of young women who are not orgasmic um, mm. is just a, appalling to me. And I, I made a, a little pamphlet for my office some years ago. <laughs> like I called it the big O and it, in it, it just described, you know, where the clitoris is uh, this, you know, different that, that what partners might be at, you could ask your partner to do for you to help, et cetera. And I made it humorous, but um, it something I, I also read once was that basically there would be zero teenage boys who would not know where their penis was. <laughs> and there are dramatically many teenage girls who don't know where their clitoris is. Um, so yeah, we're, we really, we've come a ways, but we haven't come that far. <laughs> I don't know how to, how to look at it. Well, I think that all we can do is kind of try to move forward. You know, the, um, I know I was, I was reading also three out of 10 girls will skip school because of painful periods in that's a, a lot of girls who skip school because of painful periods, you know, that's, uh, yet we don't talk much about right. men, women's menstruation and yet it's, it's, yeah. it's central, it's core, it's key. I mean, the number of patients I have with, uh, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome is quite a few or endometriosis, which causes painful intercourse very, very often. There are quite a few people who have endometriosis. And uh, it's not a well understood disease. You know, I, I often think if we're going to try to move forward, um, I guess Teresa Ray is saying something here <laughs> in the background. <laughs> Sorry, I'm seeing your guys' chat, but too small. Um, we, I think we need to think in terms of also the totality of the human experience. You know, female sexuality does include our menses, it does include potential of pregnancy, you know, then an actual pregnancy, the postpartum nursing, you know, recovery from pregnancies. These are all yeah. huge, enormous topics. And for that matter, both men and women obviously undergo aging. Right? Yeah. We all age. That's natural. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We, we first do not mature. So we're not immature sexually. Then we are mature sexually. Yes. So we're super mature sexually. You know, what happens to our bodies or our capacity to love? Yeah. What is, what happens to our capacities to, um, 
really surrender to those relation to that love relationship. What happens to the trust or bond between a man and a woman? Mm-hmm. I think these are all really interesting topics that you know we could talk about yeah. so long. I know, and pr- pregnancy is. I was thinking about this too. Is it's almost as if, in, and I'm I'm talking sort of in general. I try to to also think about sexuality with pregnancy, but in general, a woman becomes pregnant. And then we're not talking to her anymore about her, her sexual behaviors. Um, certainly we say to women, you can have sex while you're pregnant. You know, that they might have questions like that still in this day and age, but um, the, just then the body changes and with, with birth, you know, how the, the sort of birth is, is, is a very, is a sexual event. I mean, it, it, re- in order to sort of um, give over yourself into labor, there's the same relaxation, not thinking about anything else, not being disturbed. Um, mm-hmm. Many of the same body movements uh, become evident. Um, women who have body armor can, especially in pelvic segments, can, can have a more difficult time with muscle tension. Um, and then, as you mentioned, um, the you know the the newborn. Then there is is hopefully much you know body touch, and and the woman is getting that, and her hormones, if she's breastfeeding, are changing with prolactin um, being a love hormone. Mm-hmm. So her interest in sex may be low, but her love is very high. Mm-hmm. How do couples navigate that? Mm-hmm. change in sexuality that is so necessary and important um i'm i'm interested at that point to also i would love to know more even how men feel about the, that phase of their relationship with a woman who's given a birth to their child you know right. how do they how what, where does their sex drive go you know what what do they feel motivated to do you know i think that's also something it would be nice to know more about actually. Right. Yeah. There's, um, I, I, I think there, there is continues to be a difficulty, I think between men and men and women in communicating and, and we work hard at it and we do get to places where we, we do have good communication and we're able to connect but any relationship does does usually does not stay exactly in that good place for years and years and years. Every relationship can go up and go down and go up and go down. Um, it's so interesting and makes you think like, what what are we <laughs> and, and why are we? <laughs> How do we get this far to begin with? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But the drive of, you know, the, the procreation and this drive and the, the pleasure of sexual interaction, and, and I don't mean to make it sound at all as if all sexual relationships need to be between a, a female and a male. That's, I'm not saying that. Um, it, it's what I see mostly because I work with um, pregnant women. Right. You know, so, so. you remind me of one topic, and that is also the issue of how many hormones also we've been exposed to in the last, say, 100 years in our food supply, in medical treatments of all kinds, in birth control pills, most obviously, uh, hormones also during pregnancy often used to uh, stop a potential miscarriage, yeah. hormones used, given to men, uh, or to stop both to enhance or to stop testosterone levels. Uh, I mean, it's everywhere. And I have, I have wondered how that affects our biology as well. You know, you had started, you'd mentioned the thing about you mostly work with women, you know, but clearly in the last say 10 to 20 years, the issue of sexual identity has become very much in the forefront of a lot of public discussions. And when, I was reading online research from uh, international sex research organization 
most of the articles dealt with the issue of uh, sex change operations in their various and sundry forms or aspects of, of surgeries that could change a person's body. And I feel like that's uh, also, I think, poses sort of a whole new set of challenges. Mm -hmm. Where do we get our sense of our sexual identity? Is it physical? Is it somewhere deep in our brains? Uh, you know, I don't think we really know that very well. Um, but that also, the bottom line, I think, is from, I think, an ergonomic perspective, is that I think that Reich wanted very much that love guide yeah. all these relationships. Love guided. I now, know. that's both love that you apply to yourself, the sense of self-respect, as well as love or deep identification with your partner. Yes. And, and I, 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 yes, that is true. The, the, another piece of this, and I wonder, I didn't read it, but I think Jim may have brought it up in the chat, was where Wilhelm Reich talked about the fact that couples, you know, would, would have times of being close, but then maybe not. And I, I remember Reich wrote something about every, how many years was it? He thought every five years or something that people should decide whether they're gonna continue their relationship. Mm -hmm. um, that to me is, is, I don't see it working in the real world <laughs> with a relationship. <laughs> um, I, 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 think, I, I think of that as being something a man might think of. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, <laughs> I do. I, I, it, it, like, can you imagine, like if you have like a two-year-old child and you know that in one year your husband and you have to sit down and decide if you're ending or can, I, I cannot imagine that being um, something that would really work for couples for a right. woman, maybe I'd right. say for a woman, I don't know. No, um, I, I think you're right. Yeah, so so I, I, I mean, Wilhelm Reich is a brilliant man, genius man, many, but some things I disagree with being mm. a woman, <laughs> so. Well, even the issue of sexual gratification, you know, does that come straight, strictly from an orgasm or does physical orgasm or does, I actually come from a sense of trusting your partner, mm -hmm. knowing that person, uh, really uh, being a person who they can rely on also, you know, mm -hmm. that there's mutual sense of comfortable interdependence. Yes. You know, there's no other way to raise a child. There, right. I, I don't think, not successfully there has to be a degree of comfortable interdependence. You know, we, in the United States, we're very much into independence. I remember uh, in Japan, in fact, a lot of their uh, culture is based on rules of interdependence. People have to need each other and that's the way things are. And they often are uncomfortable if pushed out on their own uh, to do anything. They like to work in teams or as a cultural phenomenon. I don't, don't mean to be sort of uh, glib with it, but I, I know uh, it's a book on that topic of the psychology of dependence. And I think about the fact it's a very old society. You know, Japan is a very, very ancient culture. And I often have wondered, you know, if we look at very old cultures that are 2000 years old, you know, how have these rules and regulations about the interactions between men and women evolved? Yeah. It seems that uh, having uh, stability, obviously in family relationships, seems to be terribly important, even an absolute necessity for societies to thrive. Right. It's so interesting. I And and part of, I think, what Reich was was, speaking against was that very authoritarian kind of family um, family structure that, that he grew up in and that was prevalent um, and continues to be prevalent in, in many families and many parts of the world. Um, and women, women still, you know, have to 
kind of make their voice heard. Absolutely. <laughs> Even yeah. in very egalitarian families. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I think yeah. you're right. I think women will tend to always want to make everybody comfortable. Yeah. The first priority is like, let's accommodate everybody here. Yeah. It's and, true. and that, and the sexuality part of that kind of goes along kind of into that. Like they're, we're willing to maybe not reach our own sexuality ideal because we're, we're wanting other things also kind of to, right. to have it. Um, it reminds me, I was reading an article on uh, how women fake orgasms or people, yes. but it, in fact, it's true in both sexes, but yeah, apparently more women than men. And, and why? Well, in order to obviously still establish some sort of bond, whether or not there's this gratification in the act. Right, uh, right. It's, it's kind of sad that is, but it's very true. I mean, it, yeah. And maybe, but you know, it's sort of like maybe it's to some extent to be expected in a family that yes. if yep. we're trying to stay positive or be mutually encouraging or right. promote each other within the family, uh, that a mom will do her best right. to make sure that it happens in all directions, you know. And and as you know, women get older, or or there might be someone I saw put in the chat about cancer treatment can, can decrease the libido or different things where you, you want to, you want to be very close to your partner and sort of, yes, have them be happy. And so it's not a terrible thing, but it's right. so interesting. That I see there've been about 32 chats here. I, yeah. I was so why don't, maybe we can stop our, our, our back and forth and, and, See, I don't know if even people have questions. They may just have more like statements or, and, and we weren't sure how we were going to do this part. Um, what people could, if, if someone has something, you know, they would like to, to ask or, or just say briefly, we, we'd want to not um, miss anybody there. I think David can, can help us with this part. Um, uh, appear. Um, there have been many, many comments in the chat, and right. not necessarily questions. So right, which is great. The yeah. issue is whether you want to, you know, sort of address any of them or just move into a question period and ask people to speak uh, directly. What's your preference? Right. I think um, probably if there aren't questions, then I think if people want to, you know, say something, then that, that would be great. Um, well, I, I see there's uh, Martin Goldberg who made a comment and Therese Ray, um, Therese had said it's about young girls learning about their sexual identity in terms of self-worth and pleasing men sexually instead, rather than learning their own pleasure is important. And, uh, I think you're right. I, Teresa, I don't, I, I can't see everybody in the group. I only see a few images, faces here. Um, uh, Teresa, did you want to talk about this a little bit or did you, is she there in the audience? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Good to see you guys. Um, I'm really enjoying this discussion and I feel like, you know, coming into Reich's work as an undergrad pretty young, um, you know, this is sort of resonating with me as like, yeah, I wish I had heard these female perspectives so long ago when I was sort of learning about some of this work and I really appreciate this discussion. Um, and yeah, when you guys were talking, I was just thinking, you know, about how girls in our culture really learn about sexuality really different from how boys do, which is something you guys basically touched on um, and how we really learn that you know, we get the message, I know I did as a young girl, and a lot of the girls that I see in my primary care practice as a family medicine doctor, um, you know, the focus seems to be on, am I beautiful? Am I pleasing to a man? You know, my worth is really centered around, does some man want me? Can I give them pleasure? And can, can I keep them? 
by giving them pleasure. So I feel like a lot of our early experiences, and I know there have been articles written on this much better than I can articulate anything about it, um, but there have been really good articles talking about how a lot of young girls are really taught not even to look for their pleasure in their early sexual experiences. And so I think that's part of what you had said, Connie, about how we come away often disappointed about our early sexual experiences. I think that that feels like a part of it, um, that we're not even really taught to really look for our own, to seek our own pleasure in that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, th I think also the uh, issue of people are women emotionally in their relationships well yes and that's part of when yeah when i'm yes and i think you know our culture and pornography doesn't often include that component and it's very you know i think it's been interesting that some of the um some of my friends and i have been talking about how you know mainstream movies and stuff really just display sexuality in a very kind of aggressive way sometimes and um and from almost like a male perspective, but there has been maybe a subtle shift in that with some of the newer um, movies and things that are out in series, kind of being a little bit more ex ex showing sexuality from more of a feminist perspective, even though to me sometimes it feels like the emotional component is somewhat missing, but um, you know. Hmm. Uh, did you um, say, that younger generations are having less sex? Did you make that comment? That is a statistic that I have read a few times over the past few years that um, particularly the millennial generation is not only less independent in a lot of things in terms of, um, you know, driving a car, you know, getting a driver's license, things like that. But that statistically, from what I understand, at least in the United States, they're having less sex, much less sex than previous. But Jim had mentioned that that's not his experience as a college professor. So I don't know. I oh. see two two more hands as well, um, Priscilla, and then Natalia. Yeah, Priscilla has a hand up, so she can speak. There's also a question typed in by Frederick Lowen. We might get to, okay. and then Natalia has a okay. wants to speak. Sorry. I'm not going to be visible. Uh, Renata, you said right one to low. To guide these relationships, but all the issues within patriarchy prevent this. So we're kind of in a conundrum. We can't rid patriarchy without instilling Reich's ideas in the community, and we can't um, instill Reich's ideas in the culture without getting rid of patriarchy. So I feel like those of us activists or professional people, we need some kind of game plan or strategy to get there quicker or we're just gonna <laughs> know. gonna see the end. Could you comment on, there, there's an overlap of getting rid of patriarchy and instilling Reich's ideas, but they each uh, depend on the what happens in the other. Yeah. But I'm a little bit cynical. I don't see anything happening in, I mean, there's been a resurgence of interest in Reich's ideas that I've seen and of course, many people have been working to get rid of patriarchy for a long, long time, but they don't seem to be meeting up in a way that could uh, 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 strengthen each other and make things happen uh, exponentially. Yeah, yeah. I, you're right. I'm, I'm discouraged as well. And um, I, I don't have, an, uh, have, a, have a quick answer, unfortunately. I, I, one of the reasons I think that I, I decided or chose or loved um, birth and, and midwifery was that the thought that if you were able to have good births and, and raise little, little babies and little children in, in a loving, humane way with self-regulation, that you would end up with a society that maybe didn't um, have wars or patriarchy as much. Um, and, and I think that is true, but it's only one person here, one person there, one person there. And how you get to a whole society that's already formed um, 
with these these character structures, I, I don't know. And um, all that I feel we can do is is do whatever we can do. We can do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I there. So so that. I think what I'm trying to say is that each thing that each of us can do is of utmost importance. And we don't know the ripple effects and we don't know how that might shift a paradigm. Um, but it is also normal to be discouraged and see the war and the worsening of, of some of these, the pathology. Um, so you're right. And um, I guess none of us um, can do it all by ourselves. That's what I would say. I, I also think there's a little progress in the United States in that I think there are more women entering the political arena. And I do, maybe it's just by chance, I feel that more women are writing television shows or, or movies. <laughs> but in fact, it's shocking to realize that it's practically the first woman in the history of the Academy who won the award as best director last, this, this year which is phenomenal that this many years movies could be made in the United States and there have been effectively no women directors whatsoever. And clearly we learn a huge amount from our media these days. Girls and boys look at stuff on television, and on the internet. That's where they learn to role model. Uh, it's terribly important, I think, uh, I have felt more hopeful. I think the Me Too rev sort of, you know, era was a huge step forward for women in terms of uh, being courageous enough to directly address sexual violence communally. You know, everyone speaking up, the Me Too, that statement alone says this is a massive problem. This is not just an isolated event. It, you know, so you're right, the patriarchy is still, you know, controlling the show, but I do think there's uh, progress underway. I, I definitely see younger people in their 20s and 30s and 40s having a very different sense of their husband and wife roles. I, I was talking to a colleague, a woman who's a lawyer, who very much took for granted that her husband would be there taking care of business at home while she ran a law firm with 20 lawyers. That was for her, yeah, it's no big deal. It's like normal. <laughs> I'm going, well, that's, I, I don't know any woman in my generation who had that situation. You know, that was impressive. I, and so I thought, wow, something is changing here that uh, these women do pop up. Um, that are not afraid to speak out. Honestly, even for Renata and myself, I think we both felt, well, it's time women in organomy have a bigger forum for themselves. I mean, there are women in the field, but we've never talked about female sexuality in particular. And I don't want to say it's a bigger deal than male sexuality because they both matter. But Bottom line is we do carry the children and we do nurse them and we do the early parenting. And these are all absolutely important uh, issues. We're half, we're half of the population. They were half of the population. <laughs> part of the conversation. And I just wanted to say there is like, I, there is encouragement in movies. You know, there's Reese Witherspoon, Witherspoon and her group that are really trying to make media that passes a Bechdel test. I don't know if you're familiar with the Bechdel test, but like I was yeah. floored when I learned that that was really true, that there were like, it was 98% of movies fail the Bechdel test, which is wow. so simple. And so anyway, yeah. Well, she's somebody special. I think I, if anybody's seen the film Legally Blonde, it's a interesting comedy that effectively takes many of these practically hackneyed ideas of femininity, 
of being kind of a ditzy blonde who can't do anything right and can't really think for herself and only cares about getting her hair and her nails done and reveals her as a character who can be the best student at Harvard Law School. So I, I appreciate the idea of trying to create any kind of stronger identity for women. I, you know, I've watched Beyonce's videos and they're extraordinary. She has, in the sense of, I feel they re repeatedly try to convey a message of female empowerment and a message of that she expects emotional fulfillment, that she's not okay with just being abandoned or having a lousy spouse, you know, that she's talking about her discontent. And there was one film she made where she was disappointed. I mean, they're kind of harsh, but it, very interesting to see from a cultural standpoint, because she is a very wealthy woman. You know, there are, and, and that economic strength and her professional strength does, I think, spill over to women in general. I do. I think it makes a difference for women to see other women speaking up and talking about themselves and being open about their own personal experiences and their disappointments. Yeah. yeah. Dave, David, is there another person with a question? Yeah, if we're gonna get to some of the people um, who have asked to speak, we, okay. we probably need okay. to pace things a little faster. So yeah. Natalia yeah. and Kate has a hand up and there were some other questions, but let's move on to Natalia. So I guess for the sake of time, I'll try to uh, be quick. Um, so bullet points, I guess. Um, I have a lot of hope. I'm a millennial and I'm 34. I just, and um, it's all over Instagram. Um, sexual awareness uh, for women is just blooming right now. There's also what's called the um, uh, clit test, which is applied to media. So if there are films um, that do not acknowledge the existence of the clitoris, it will not pass the test. If the, is the woman typically 96% of the time is portrayed um, having an orgasm, you know, barely being touched right. or having intercourse for 10 seconds and she has an orgasm, which is um, extremely confusing to um, especially the younger generation watching sex scenes. But anyway, um, the time of the timing of this um, of this talk couldn't have been more perfect for my life um, because I'm 34. I just got out of a relationship of, of 10 and a half years. And finally, I'm feeling, I mean, amazing sex. And now I'm worried about the connection, the love. Mm -hmm. That's, and Isn't that makes that sense. That's that's <laughs> like the pain. That's like we're vulnerable. We open, and the 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 chance could be that that we that we lose maybe, but the, also the chance is that it it continues, and there there is just as much or even better chance that it continues. And so so the fear goes away. You just yeah, it's. Um, I and thank you for for sharing that. I I think if so, anybody who who does share is fine. Um, let us know though in in the chat if you want us to kind of clip that piece out in case this is posted later for for you know the world. To oh, see. I'm fine. You can include. Okay. I'm happy to share because I think it really. I see myself exactly in in the topics that everyone is bringing up. And yes, that's beautiful. And it and that and. Fabulous. I, I thank you for, for sharing. Yeah, was, thank you also. Sharing. It made me remember something I did want to bring up about Reich because he, when I first read his work and then long time ago, my 20s, I recognized a huge number of things that he wrote about, including the sense of when you have a very full orgasm that there would be streaming, an experience of streaming through the extremities. And I remember at the time I had had those experiences with somebody who I was very, very deeply in love with, but the relationship ended. And in fact, trying to, I want to say recover from that loss was huge for me. And I uh, think that Reich did write about this as well. You know, that there are, 
um, maybe Jim had mentioned it, I think somewhere in his text, you know, about the fact that there can be losses and difficulties in this process of trying to uh, really approach a deeper love. Now, the fellow broke up with me. Maybe I could think, oh, he was armored. You know, I don't know. You know, maybe I can think to myself, oh, I'm, you know, doing okay here. But in fact, I suffered a lot, you know, being very vulnerable, letting down, really falling in love. It's, it can be very painful, even though the sexual experience was amazing. <laughs> you know, so I just thought I should mention, mention that because it is also a personal experience, you know, that made a difference for me in how I understood Reich. Yeah. Hmm. We did, um, the, the man and I, um, who I'm currently seeing, we have practice being really conscious and open with each other about how we feel, which has been amazing. We talked about it and we acknowledged that I guess sometimes you do pick the pain because you know that it comes with all this pleasure because it's all part and parcel of the whole experience. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah. or, or not, I, I mean, I'm open to no, seeing, that's, that's think true. That. I think it's, yeah, there's, it's lovely to, to connect with somebody and have those experiences. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> Thank you. We have Kate holding uh, her hand up for some time. Would Kate like to speak? Hey, um, okay. Wait just a second. How do I do that? That's <laughs> working. How do I, do that? How do I was able to unmute you. We hear you. Okay. Now can you hear me? Yeah. We hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know how to go about this because uh, first of all, the young woman that was just speaking, I totally agree with her. <laughs> and I think I didn't get in, I didn't understand all this till I was in my sixties. <laughs> so I, cause I'm in the Midwest. I was Catholic, Irish Catholic. I was a good girl <laughs> and I married a bad boy and I had four girls and bad boy left. So I've been through all the bullshit and all the hurt and all the pain. And now it's time for me to be more alive and have my own life. And I don't think enough older women mm. are being involved in looking at what's going on in the world. That young woman is at a time in her life where energy is flowing. Guess what? That energy he talks about is in us that I don't care if you're a man or a woman, what are we doing? And I think some, you mentioned it and I'm not gonna name names, but I get really intense and excited by what you're all talking about. How, how many of, okay, all of us have looked into some of this. How have we um, looked into things we're afraid of? What are some of the things that can touch us? And um, I don't think it's an age thing. I think it's a life energy thing and we can't lose it. Mm. That's all. <laughs> it is energy. That's lovely. That's great. Thanks. Huh. Can, I just, can I just say something super briefly about the age thing? Cause I brought this up in the chat and I thought it was, I was just curious to see what other people's experiences or perspectives are, but as a primary care doctor, one of the things that I noticed that I'm coming across the most, and part of it's that a lot of my panel are women that are in like a menopausal transition, but I noticed that a lot of, a lot of men come to my office and are completely comfortable saying, I'm, you know, I'm older and I can't have an erection anymore. Please give me Viagra. And like, it's sort of understood that their sexual experience is important. And there's not a shame around saying, I really want to make sure I have this back in my life. Whereas women, I feel like the women that have come to me and I'm still early in my practice, it hasn't been a ton, but I've, my experience has been is that they come very ashamed, really struggling to find words to describe that my, you know, my life transition is making it such that sex, I used to have a, a good sex life and now it's painful and I want to have this, this is something that was valuable to me. And there's almost a shame in saying that I value this pleasure and connection and I miss it. And um, anyway, so I think it's, it's interesting, not just in the younger generation, but I mean, I don't know, I guess it just continues throughout the life. Anyway, I applaud that woman who is saying that she's, you know, 
60. And really, you know, I think it's something that women, I, I would hope women would have the ability to experience throughout their life and that we would continue to allow it to feel comfortable for women throughout the life stage just to really talk about and acknowledge. Well, on that note, uh, uh, Therese, there is a poem from Hafiz as a mystic poet, Sufi mystic poet, who talks about uh, his teacher, keeps on teasing him that he's a, he's a pregnant woman and he keeps, and Hafiz is finally bothered by this. Why do you keep calling me a pregnant woman? What is this supposed to mean? I, just stop it. And he said, no, you don't understand. The words that are in you right now are going to be birthed into incredible poetry that will feed generations to come. It's the concept that, I, I guess I'm bringing it up because I'm thinking about, you know, our bodies do this physical function of serving this emotional intimacy. But we are, in a sense, more than our bodies, you know, and we do have consciousness and and how we use our consciousness in our sexual lives is incredibly important. But it's true when our bodies age, we continue to grow. We have continued to have ways to be to give out or to be generous or to be pregnant in a sense. Yes. And I think that's a really interesting way to see life. It is something I want to quickly put in here. I know we have a few other people with comments we want to get to, but is the organ energy accumulator I have found is incredibly helpful as I get older, that that increases my energy, increases my sexual interest. Um, and so I, I know anyway, that that isn't our focus today, but, but I think Wilhelm Reich's other work besides therapy and function of the orgasm um, is, is applicable when you get older and it can be yeah. helpful. Yeah. Renata, um, I have found that to be true too for myself and I'm in my forties, but right. I have so, found that to be true for myself too. And I'm really hoping I can get to a point where I would feel comfortable in the clinical context starting to really talk about yeah, this, but this is, you know, I'm still so that's early. That's a whole nother it. thing, isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, David, do we have the next? So I'll just mention, there was a question from Frederick Lowen. Can you discuss the role of neurosis and emotional disturbance on sexuality and how it is transmitted down generations? Um, it's been hanging there. Okay. Boy, that's kind of a big topic. <laughs> pretty, the, the nut of the um, whole. I'll, I'll start a little bit that that when there is, you know, when there's armoring, a neurosis, whatever you want to call it, then the response of the parent to the child um, is one that, that just basically passes down these, the armorings and the neurosis into the next generation. Um, because the child, the, the baby and the child is flowing usually so, so strongly with energy and, and vitality and, and, you know, feeling its own um, sexual feelings. And the, the parent who, who then is face to face with that um, feels a very strong uh, anger or aversion or, or must kind of clamp it down. So, so that's such a simplistic way to answer a very deep question. Connie? Well, I think um, he's asking a question to sort of get us back to what Reich, you know, the Reich's original thinking and talking about uh, the development of, of energetic armoring in the individual and how when we uh, are born, or we're in utero, we're born, we grow up, and through the phases of our life, we are exposed to different types of emotional disappointments or traumas. And in order to protect ourselves from that pain, we develop different types of energetic armoring or blockades to the free flow of emotional and physical energy in our bodies. So if, a, for example, if a child is um, not nurtured at the breast, uh, potentially that child is, feels repeated disappointment or anger and can have a tendency to bite in her, his or her disappointment or rage. And that becomes a chronic unconscious 
uh, phenomena that kind of bears itself into the tissue of the individual himself or herself as they grow older. It's just one little, <laughs> one example. So when, when you then become an adult and uh, uh, yourself uh, have a child, let's say, uh, maybe you will have also then still issues with this, with the issue of, of nursing, uh, of feeding your own child. Um, and so whatever neurotic structures or neurotic responses to life you have grown up with, you will continue to express when you become a parent. And that goes on and on and on in that way. So I felt it was really important to try to teach uh, young people and young parents and uh, the optimal way to help people grow, you know, the optimal ways to take care of little ones, to take care of your pregnancy, to take care of all of these physical functions that ultimately have a huge impact on us. Uh, pot, uh, potty um, training, for example, when children are learning how to use a toilet, you know, there were uh, often very punitive strategies used to try to teach kids to, you know, use a toilet on their own. Well, this had very negative impact on children. You know, I hope that is very rare these days that kids are raised in that manner, but in different cultures that very well still probably may be, you know, um, that's, I hope Fred, that helps somehow to describe what the role of neurosis is and it's emotional disturbance on sexuality. Uh, I don't know where he is, but in any case. Um, I, I may be missing one or two, but I'm going to flip all the cards on what's my line and just okay. let Jim make a comment about orgastic okay. potency. You're, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, Renata touched on this at the beginning, but I feel like our awareness of it has sort of come in and out during the discussion and that it's one of the biggest things about Reich's understanding that most commonly either gets completely missed by people or forgotten periodically during their thinking because they fall back into thinking the way that we all think in this culture. And that is the, the distinction of what orgastic potency is. Um, I've been working my way through this new book, Everybody, by Olivia Lang, that's getting a lot of press, where she celebrates at great length Reich's early breakthroughs in therapy technique, um, but is later convinced that his later laboratory work is pseudoscience. And even in the parts where she really appreciates thoroughly a lot of what Reich did in psychotherapy, I'm not 100% clear if she understands what orgastic potency is. And that's so central to everything that comes after in Reich's work. And so central to what we think about when we talk about people's sexual experience. It, Reich said it's, it's not just about having sex. It's not even just about having lots of sex. That's not the thing. Orgastic potency is not just having sex. And um, it's an it's a easy distinction to miss because almost nobody in our culture has ever thought of it that way before. But that's what matters. Um, I mean, Lang says, you know, this famous French historian, Michel Foucault, scathingly observes in his book, The History of Sexuality, that if the orgasm is so powerful, why is it that the vastly expanded sexual liberties of the sexual revolution of the 1960s have failed to dissolve capitalism or topple the patriarchy, despite all Reich's ardent predictions to the contrary? It's because there's a huge amount of sex going on, but not that much in the way of orgastic potency, you know, genuine ability to completely surrender to the experience. And discharge all of the accumulated energy. Can I, I just thought of something, Jim, and, and I, this is sort of heretical to say it, but where 
what we have noticed just in practice with, with more women being unable to have orgasms or the, the armoring affecting their ability to be orgasmic so, so powerfully in women, is it possible, and I, there's no way to prove this, that women actually are more orgasmically potent possibly than men? if they are orgasmic, then the orgasms they're having, I'm not, I'm totally like, you know, saying this just as a, I'm just, it's just so interesting because in my experience and the women that I n have been interacting with for years, they're not as likely to have orgasms just in sort of unconnected ways and so for them, there, there is this very powerfulness often to the orgasms that they do have with a partner. Um, so I'm not, I'm just, it's just a, a thought, like, like, how will we ever know, like any of <laughs> the differences between men and women? Well, I'm not a woman. So I know, and I'm not a man. So. I, hes I hesitate to say too much. I mean, Right. Bioelectric experiments, I think, are very exciting, very exciting. and suggestive <laughs> in this regard. Is that me with feedback or is that somebody else with feedback? Is somebody else not muted? Um, you know, it is theoretically possible to measure the amount of energy discharge. Yeah. Although even in those experiments, Reich laments that it's probably impossible to get anything like the actual experience of uninhibited sexuality in a laboratory setting. But well, I wonder, I mean, women's, I women's testimony would be the more important thing, I think. Anyway, I don't mean I to, I just, I just want, I just, there's so many interesting levels to all of this. And, and that emotional connection seems to be a big, a big piece and and there, there's something going on in our society where women seem to somehow be able, I'm, I'm making too many generalization, generalizations, but that emotional piece is, is like the piece in, in the woman that, that then kind of leads into the better sex. Um, and that is, this, that's sort of what we're talking about with orgastic potency, that the emotional connection helps the, the streaming of the... There's a question from Ray Coppola. Hi, Ray. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, it was actually, it was more, it was more a comment. Um, I'm very struck as I'm listening. I'm a psychologist and uh, I have a number of young women and young men that are my uh, patients. And one of the things that's sort of heartbreaking is that a lot of them are um, establishing their contact with each other th through two things. First of all, there's a huge amount of texting that goes on. And the texting itself um, will go on and on and on, and it won't allow for the kind of intimacy that might happen they're having discussions that you don't want to have through texting. And then the way that they're meeting um, using dating apps. Um, so this whole issue is about um, intimacy. And when, um, so they're having sexual experiences that are not particularly fulfilling and they become routine. And that's the expectation is that this is just what it is. And I mean, I'm very grateful for uh, you know, having been for many years a, a patient myself in psychiatric hormone therapy. So just the bit that I can do with them in terms of their relationship to their own vu vulnerability, first of all, which they would not even know until you say, can you, can you take a nice deep breath into your chest and relax your jaw and let out a nice sigh for me? And it takes a, a lot of work to make that happen. And once they can begin to breathe, and then I might ask them at a certain point, so what do you feel in your solar plexus right now? And the response the other day from a, you know, a very handsome, very armored guy was, 
oh, I have a feeling in my solar plexus like when it's Christmas time. And, you know, it's just because getting him to soften to be able to relate to his own vulnerability. And so, um, I mean, I'm grateful for this work and I'm grateful, you know, every time I get an email, it suggests there's another talk or there's something else going on in the world of, of psychiatric organ therapy because um, this is virtually unknown that, you know, like the idea of everything is cognitive behavioral or it's very much related to um, coping skills and strategies and very far away from the experience of being related to one's own vulnerability. And when you don't even know that, because what feels like normal to you and relaxed is actually pretty heavily armored. Yeah. Yes. I appreciate your saying that about, um, you know, the state, the status of therapy today, because it's very hard to interject into the therapy process, you know, that is expected of us in most professional settings. You know, uh, the cognitive behavioral model has taken so a tight hold of psychiatry, that or pharmacological model. Uh, that it's it's pretty it's a pretty tough field out there in many ways um, to talk like you have with just because you have a, a to a patient I try to do that as well um, and I do have I guess I have not had you work with adolescents now Ray are you working with a fair amount of adolescents a few, a few adolescents mostly young adults like in their early twenties right. okay. Yeah. And you find that texting is that commonplace that people don't actually talk with each other on the phone or Zoom meet, they just text. Oh, yeah, no, they, yeah, all, and all day long. So and I'm always having to ask, did you text that or did you, did you talk about that? No, no, we texted that. And um, there's just so many layers of contact that can't be had through a text message. Sure, sure. I mean, you can say maybe there's an advantage to being able to connect at all. But uh, I also feel that sometimes these forums or ways to communicate are simply substandard and people become very accustomed to them and don't even try to like be in someone's space actually. Like actually to meet with somebody. Not, I mean, a Zoom meeting is thankfully we even have them, but to actually be together with somebody, it's almost like it's become, well, I know the time of COVID people have had to be separated and that's been very difficult for people um, but I'm afraid it's encouraged a certain sort of isolationism, you know, all around uh, that we are, you know, younger people having a harder time to just know each other. You know, there's a lot of uh, social abuse. You may all remember there was a, a congresswoman here in California who apparently had taken some pictures of a sexual relationship she was having with somebody who might've been part of her campaign. I think she was 32 or so. She was a young woman and she had to withdraw. She had to actually resign as a Congresswoman because that was so very, uh, she was basically told she had to do so by you know, the head of the Democratic party. You know, I remember thinking about that at the time I go, wow, you know, um, that's too bad. You know, she won an important election and I guess she didn't have she wasn't careful enough with her media so that these pictures somehow came into the public eye. It, it does make the issue of sexual connection that much more difficult for people, but certainly you can wonder why was she, why, you know, you can ask how involved sexually can you be if you're taking a lot of pictures and posting them or sharing them even, you know, where is, how do we really understand intimacy? You know? Yeah. That's kind of a, a basic question. Um, David, are there other things? Um, well, Jackie speak? Goss just asked, um, so many young people now identify as they or gender queer, yeah. how they fit into this conversation. And it is a really interesting question because in some ways there's so much freedom of information and exchange. And then in other ways, nothing has changed apparently in this very deep topic that Reich addressed I also, I just want to comment myself that there are many, many really thoughtful comments, you know, where people are just bringing up different uh, aspects of Reich's contributions to this topic. And everyone should be reminded there's no, no alternative but to go to the source um, 
to, to right. really delve into yeah. this. Yeah, you know, I also want to thank people. There have been a lot of really incredibly beautiful and thoughtful comments. I hope people are reading the chat line yeah. because there's a lot being said that's very useful. Right. So. And and for Jackie, I I I want every young person to be able to be who they feel they are. And so I I don't um, have any answers to to you know why or or whatever but i think that it's it's definitely real and um for a young person who feels like like they are um you know misgendered and then they i'm i'm glad that we live in a time when they can seek out um ways to to feel as if they can self-actualize to to be who they their soul feels to be um I would agree. I mean, I, I think in, uh, I'm not doing a right now psychiatric organ therapy with people in my office, but I have had patients uh, in the practice who are, who are non-binary and they're, they're maybe taking hormones or maybe gone through sex change. And um, yeah. And I would say often, I, I, so far, it has seemed as if that has been the primary issue for that individual the issue of sexual identity has really been unbelievably important. Uh, and I have to say, you know, it's a complicated uh, problem to kind of uh, tease apart and help someone with, um, but important and necessary. I'm just glad, I guess, more attention is being paid to it right now. So more, people in the world of therapy are trying to understand better. I know there's some uh, people who specialize in, in, in that patient population here in California, but in terms of ergonomy, you know, I think uh, I don't, it's an interesting question to ask. Ultimately, as I think I tried to say, I think that uh, Reich wanted people to deepen in their capacity for love. Yeah. Now that, is irrespective of what your anything, what your makeup might be, physical or otherwise. You know, even before we had, you know, the issues of transsexual or homosexual uh, issues, we've always had people born, say, with ambiguous genitalia, or uh, a problem such as testicular feminization, which is a problem with the testosterone receptors, so that somebody who's actually uh, physically a male will, or uh, genetically a male will grow as a female. So there have been historically these kind of sort of uh, gray zones in how our bodies have expressed our sexuality, gray in the sense of they're not, not, a, they're not a clear man, they're not a clear woman. They have been challenging historically for the medical community, I know. Doctors have often tried to figure out, well, what do we do with a little girl, a little boy who's born with ambiguous genitalia? And I know uh, it has seemed that things are trending in a direction so as to allow for more basic respect for these individuals, no matter how they come into the world or how they feel themselves to be in the world. It's like, how can you encourage somebody's sense of self-value and help them to love fully? That's, that's what the point is, I think, of Reich's work. <laughs> yeah, there was, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to ask the question is so many of my students identify as they, and it's done in a really playful way. It's not, it's, you know, often has nothing to do with, I'd say a kind of essentialist idea about biology or, you know, even how they present themselves. But it, it, it almost seems like it's done in a gesture of play. Mm -hmm. And I guess I've been trying to square that a little bit with just, you know, the readings I've done of, in Reich. And, you know, where it mostly seems to connect for me is, you know, when he talks about sort of sometimes he identifies as being like a playful puppy. <laughs> I, I've encountered that a couple of times and I, I, I sort of see it there. Like, um, yeah, some idea about, about, about play and, you know, sexuality and gender, but it's just interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Um, so we're getting, we're getting close to quarter of, um, I don't know, David, if there's anything else that's pressing from questions or or we I think um, we will ultimately um, post this 
And if anyone made any comments that they don't want publicly posted, if they let me know very quickly, I could remove them. I don't think they're, well, I can only think of one person who might have uh, off the top of my head, but, um, and the chat will also be posted uh, along with the video. Um, but otherwise I would just say maybe some final thoughts. And if anyone still has something to add, perhaps raise your hand. Well, I, I just hope that there might be more discussion going on in ergonomy on this topic in the coming yeah. years. Uh, yeah, just, I'd love to. Yeah, just even talking about sexuality per se, in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was so central to Reich's work. And I think there's a reason for it. <laughs> Big reason, huge even. Yeah. It sure matters if women will lead those discussions. <laughs> yeah. It would help a lot. Right. And you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's fun. I would love this to continue. Um, it looks like Frederick Lowen has asked, how do you raise your hand? So, oh, David, I'm. Oh, um, sure he... good question. I haven't done it lately. Uh, I think it's under reactions, maybe. Yeah. Under reactions, you you click. No, that's how you do a hand wave and a thumbs up. See, you're right. Um, Why not just unmute right. him? He should just say something like, like unmute himself and then he can, he can, he can unmute himself. Can you hear me? Well, Frederick, you're welcome to speak. Sure. Well, I just, uh, <clears throat> you know, as a bioenergetic psychotherapist, uh, and, and of course, uh, the bioenergetics is derived entirely from, um, from Wilhelm Reich. So I think my thinking is informed by Reich. I just like to add that in my view, I think really what causes the difficulty in the emotional connection, the capacity to connect emotionally is fear. Uh, fundamentally is fear. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about how fear of being hurt, of course, is, is obvious. But I think on an emotional level, you've got a lot of different fears. You've got the fear of abandonment, you've got the fear of humiliation, the fear of being used, perhaps, uh, the fear of not being seen, not being validated. And all these fears, of course, are are much more on an unconscious level. And one of the huge fears, uh, which was expressed by one of the young women earlier, was basically that fear of falling in love, which I certainly observe, if not interpret, as being a fear of desire, which itself is huge. And I think most fundamentally, you know, this conflict of a fear of desire is really most fundamental to the problem of being able to um, um, connect emotionally, which I think is the missing link to uh, so-called orgastic potency um, in orgasm. So I'll just say that and get off the air. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I very, very much appreciate and, uh, and welcome your efforts. It's, it's fantastic. <laughs> good to see you. Thank you so much. It's very good to see you. Thank we you. also need to thank Elisa for translating on the Spanish language in channel. Yes, thank you, Elisa. That's been helpful. Thank you so much. Thank, thank everybody for coming. I'm really yes. thrilled to see so many people and so many incredibly interesting comments. A uh, lot of really bright folks have said things here on our chat. Yes. So thank you for coming. Incredibly. And thank you, Connie, so oh, much. Sure, my pleasure. It's always good. Good to see everybody. <laughs> so um, David, where will this be posted? Someone asked that, like, how do you go to find the video? We have a YouTube channel that can be found youtube.com slash Wilhelm Reich Museum and uh, on our website wilhelmreichmuseum.org there is a programs and events page and all of our talks uh, there are links to all of our talks there and a donate button so thank you for, donate button, so for donating can anything can I, can I throw in one idea before we close is that all right sure, sure. So it's because it's 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 what I have been kind of like internal. It's my first time to the group, so thank you. Um, Susan Boyd speaking, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
and it's what it, it's been my kind of like what's been percolating in me while I've been listening to all of you talk. And so the so sexual potency or orgastic potency, I've really enjoyed when that's come up come up in the conversation. And without um, without throwing a big <laughs> something huge in, at the very end of the conversation, it's just uh, so orgasm, even like masturbating or even with a partner the orgasm that comes from in my in my opinion the orgasm that comes from connecting to source energy is is orgas or is orgasm orgasmic potency right that and and i think what has challenged me in this conversation is that we keep talking about or i keep hearing orgasm relating to the partner and i think and then, and then patriarchy and women and orgasm that's somehow tied to their partner, whether it's male or female, tied to their partner is a way of giving away their energy and so much. I mean, let's just talk about women and men just because, you know, whatever, if that's um, not to be uh, judgy about that. Um, but if we're going to talk about patriarchy and what might source that, then we have to talk, then we would talk about women giving their sexual energy over to men, like in the relationship, like their orgasm somehow connected to connecting to the man or being in this relationship with a man or the giving of giving to the man. It just feeds the patriarchal concept. Whereas I think I have read right a long time ago and not probably as much as you guys, but sexual, po he's talking organic energy is source energy, right? So the, the orgasm that's connected to source energy is orgasmic potency. Having nothing, having to do, if you're, if you're in a relationship, if you're, if you're having sex with a partner, then having to do with the partner, but having nothing to do with the partner, if you understand what I'm saying. And I just haven't heard that in this conversation, like owning it. Like, like that your that the, the real orgasm comes from the stimulation and through the body and up and out into source and cycling through. At the risk of saying, go ahead. Go I've ahead. Been, anyway, I enjoyed when James brought it up and it got brought up one other time. And I just wanted to kind of like throw out that as an idea. It actually sounds to me like it would be useful to have a, a program specifically on the idea of orgastic potency. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. clarify those kinds of questions. That would be good. Yeah. I think something I, I just second Martin, Martin, just second, let me say something and then you can, I, I totally agree with you, Susan, that, that orgasm by oneself, it, it and, Part of that is, is just the ability of the streaming of the energy through your body that is totally excellent. And yes, I, I think the piece that maybe, and, and you bring up a really good point that like when you have two organisms close to each other, then the potential becomes even larger possibly because you have the two streaming like through each other and up and through and it's like an increased potential that may be where Reich was, was sort of coming from with always was talking about the partner and the connection and, and a really a, a, an energy connection between the two bodies. Right. So there's um, like, there's more than just those two people in that, in that sexual yes, interchange, yes. It's the right? energy it's, that's yeah. surging between yeah. the two of them, yeah. Um, yeah. which indeed is the same energy that's surging in the one person and into the um, atmosphere yeah. and, um, yeah, I enjoyed I, that conversation. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. So anyway, Martin, go ahead. You had something to add, I think, about this, but you're muted. I can't hear you. All there right, you go. Now I can speak. I, I feel a need to really say something. You know, we don't need to guess at what Reich said. He's very clear and has been and had been kind of uniquely in the, in, in the community since the late 20s. So much so that, you know, you know Freud and others had trouble with it because Reich was so clear about the bioeconomy of orgasm and that that was, it didn't mean that other forms of sexual release, homosexuality or other pregenital activities or other masturbation of what we're all capable of 
doesn't afford some level of release. He was entirely clear, however, that the bioeconomy of two people really merging, that's his entire thinking of when he's, of where he, he moved from understanding this as a libido phenomena and moved into the laboratory to then his work in biophysics, he understood that as a form of, of, of superimposition. It's not that maybe it was more potential, it absolutely is more potential in what he called the genital embrace when two beings, when a man and a woman free of other identifications can fully surrender to each other. I really suggest that people go back and read Reich if they haven't in his interview, in the interview about Freud, where he tells Eisler who's interviewing him about the, about the genital embrace, he says, you see, it's not just the fuck, it's the loss of your entire spiritual ego or self where you're merging with another and what that means and the ability to do it. The fact that it's so, that's missing largely in our society. How are people gonna even teach children this when they don't see it themselves? And then he goes on in that interview and says, and then you ask why the world is in a mess. And so here we are, even in this conversation amidst all kinds of sexual confusion, it going in all kinds of directions, Reich provides some real coherence here. He maybe didn't live it all in his own life. That's unimportant. What's, in, what's important are the teachings and the principles. And, and, I think Martin, and I Martin, think, I think you're much clearer about it. Than right. we do. I, I know, I hear you, Martin. I think there's though the reality of we don't always have that partner and and there are aspects of women's sexuality that yeah so it it i mean i i i hear you but i also hear susan and um i'm not saying i'm not trying to change reich's definition i'm i'm just listening well i just think I, I, and i'm not trying to change reich's definition either i'm just trying to I, we have to also consider that in those relationships, there's a lot of women that are going without orgasms. <laughs> so, you know, how to address that, right? So, and, 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 it, and theory is great, but it does have to move into practice, so, right? So I'm so, right. No, it's, it's very true. I'm just thinking we're, we're at 10 of five. And um, I think we we're trying to, to sort of say goodbye at, at yeah. quarter of at the latest. So um, you know, I think that maybe it's helpful that uh, both are kind of right. I think, yeah. Martin, what you're saying is absolutely true. Um, actually, I think maybe Susan, uh, uh, you know, maybe was not so well understood to begin when, with what she's saying, because even now, if you're saying, Susan, what about all the women who, who can't come to orgasm? It's true that women have a less successful rate of successful orgasm than men do, apparently, uh, according to statistics I recently read, 100% of the men masturbate. And uh, I think probably about 75% of women. So that's already a big difference that, you know, there are many women who don't even know how or never to the idea that they've never tried it at all would suggest that there are a lot of women who have, are very, very out of touch with their bodies. And so the idea what you're describing, Martin, of what Reich was talking about with the cosmic superimposition that, you know, the overlapping of two energetic fields, that that is obviously his ideal. But I think what Susan is talking about is the reality is, is maybe different. And we need to understand that. And that's why we're here in a way is to move the ball down the field so that we are maybe more successfully able to reach that ideal that Reich is talking about. I think that's what I would say. <laughs> You're shaking your head. I'm sorry. I would say that it's time to wrap yeah. this conversation. So. Start this but it's very clear that we have the beginnings of another very rich conversation okay. that I think, you know, can easily be the subject of a future webcast. Um, so uh, perhaps with a related reading. Uh, right. Yeah, perhaps that would be a good idea for as a starter. Um, we haven't tried that yet, but I think that would be a great idea. Um, but thanks again to our speakers. Thank you, um, Thank you everybody. Thank and you. to everybody for all of the thoughtful questions and comments. Oh, and Thank Martin, you. he said you ask why the world isn't a mess after talking to Eisler about circumcision, as I recall.
it's a piece. It's a yeah. it's of a piece. Absolutely. And, and sorry, I didn't mean to extend. <laughs> Okay, bye bye. We yeah, can talk for everybody. Eight hours. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, David, can we keep the chat? Will people be able to read the chat on the yes, website? Yes, it's all going to be saved. And, okay. and yeah. Because there are a lot of really good comments there. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Absolutely. And thank you, Susan, for your input as well. Yeah. Yeah. And again, Elisa, our Translating. gratitude and our sympathy. <laughs> Really, that would have been hard. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Have a great Bye -bye. holiday weekend, everybody, too. Yeah.